I'm director of the Health Sciences Library System, and I want to thank you for coming. And out on this chilly Friday afternoon, and I want to welcome you to today's lecture. Before I introduce Dr. Humphreys, I would like to invite you all to visit the exhibit that's currently on display in Falk Library called Binding Wounds, Pushing Boundaries, African Americans in Civil War Medicine. And the exhibit was developed by the National Library of Medicine and will be on display until November 20th. And I hope you join us immediately afterwards for a cookie reception um, in the library and to visit the exhibit. The committee for arranging the exhibit and this event includes Five very hardworking people, Julia Dom, the Chair, Coordinator for Technology in Integration Services at HSLS, Dr. Gosha Port, Head of Resources Development, Dr. John Erlin, History of Medicine Librarian, Rebecca Miller, Research and Instruction Librarian, and Rhoda Luton from the Administrator in the Director's Office. And today's events are also co-sponsored by the Office of Health Sciences diversity. And I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Margaret Humphreys. Um, she is with Josiah Charles Trent, Professor of History of Medicine at Duke University in Raleigh, Durham. Durham. In Durham. Sorry about that. Um, she holds a PhD in History of Science from Harvard University and an MD also from Harvard Medical School. She's a specialist in the history of medicine um, and science. And she's focused her research and publications primarily on infectious diseases in the United States and the American South, as well as the history of medicine during the American Civil War. Dr. Humphreys has also published on the history of diabetes, public health ethics, and colonial medicine. From her long list of accomplishments of note are her books, in the first one called Intensely Human, the Health of Black Soldiers in the American Civil War, and most recently, a book called Marrow of Tragedy, the Health Crisis of, America, of the American Civil War. Today's talk is titled African Americans in Civil War Medicine. <laughs> that book, Marrow of Tragedy, came out and you know, went up on Amazon, and that's always a big point when you publish the book. Oh my gosh, on Amazon. And Amazon suggests you might also be interested in, you know, and it had a whole bunch of Civil War medicine related books below. But one thing caught my eye, it was a little red box with a little white doggy on it. And so the book's called Marrow of Tragedy, and they recommended Marrow Bone Dog Biscuits. <laughs> I should have gotten the screenshot, but they took it. Somebody must have told them. I don't think so. Anyway, let's see. So what I'm going to talk about today grows out of the exhibit that is downstairs, two floors, which takes as its focus the fact that suddenly there are black doctors who we can find in the American Civil War. There are some black nurses we can find in the American Civil War when these positions, this achievement, was hidden before. And so, Jill Newmark, who was the librarian who really put this exhibit together, um, had me work with her on some of this. Um, and I thought what I would emphasize in this talk is what a remarkable change it was, what an unthinkable thing it was from people looking, say, in 1855 or 1858, and talk about some particular instances and how it happened. So that's some of what I'm interested in here. If I'm unclear to you tonight, or you just have a question, raise your hand. We're, I mean, it's a big crowd, but we can be informal. OK. So just a brief. Uh, rundown on antebellum America and where African Americans were. There were four million African Americans in slavery in the South. There were about half a million free colored people, many of them in the North, and some of those people had acquired education. In the 1850s saw many firsts, the first black lawyer, the first black attends Harvard Medical School. And that's Martin Delaney down here in the corner. 
Unfortunately, the white Harvard medical students were not as thrilled about it as they might have been, and they rioted, and they had to ask Delaney to leave. But, you know, it's Harvard. They work on diversity there in Harvard. So, um, diverse women in medical school, but all these numbers remain small. So, the other thing to try to give you a very quick understanding of, and it's a good thing John Erwin uh, isn't here because he'd stand up and say, well, I mean, that's too simplistic, um, is that it was very complicated and multi-layered. Some physicians still learned their trade by doing an apprenticeship with a practicing doctor, reading some books, and then starting to practice on their own, particularly on the frontier, the less um, civilized and structured parts of American life. There were diploma mills where you could basically pay them the money that give you the degree. Um, and perhaps we haven't gone so far from that model in some situations today. There were schools that were so-called sectarian schools or alternative types of healers, homeopaths, botanic healers, so-called eclectic medical schools. Um, on the other hand, and it's part of what's complicated is there's this hierarchy, there were also the best medical students who studied at school you would have heard of. Harvard, Yale, um, the school that would become Columbia Medical School, Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and the best of those students went abroad to study in France or in Edinburgh to get more hospital training because the hospitals in the United States were very few and there just weren't that many hospital training opportunities here. Um, a few places admitted women or blacks to medical training. Now, one person I want to follow in this uh, talk and tell you a bit about is this man, Joseph Dennis Harris. I'm writing a biography of Dr. Harris, um, and I first came across him, though, when he was a doctor in the American Civil War. He's born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the son of three blacks and, and one of ten very remarkable children. Many of his brothers also founded colleges and became bishops and did all sorts of things. I sort of think it was their mother who was the most remarkable of them all, but I don't know enough to say that. We're going to look at where he was before the war, during the war, and after the war. He was born to free black parents in Fayetteville, North Carolina. As I said, he probably had two white grandfathers. That's a whole other story I could talk about if you like. He learned to read and write. He learned his father's trades of masonry and plastering. Uh, at some point, he learned the skills of blacksmithing. He's listed as a blacksmith in the 1850 census. Uh, after his father died, he and his mother and all his brothers and sisters went to Ohio because things were getting very unpleasant in North Carolina by then for free blacks. And then in 1854, he was in Iowa. Um, and a mid-decade census had him as a plasterer, so he's following his father's building trades. But then this odd book shows up. Jill Newmark, the same woman who put together this exhibit downstairs, found this. And she said, so there's a book in this library, in one of the Iowa libraries, and it has J.D. Harris in the 1856, it's a poem. And I thought, that's not right. He wasn't an MD yet. He was never in Iowa. I mean, I didn't know that yet, that he was. And it's just got to be somebody else. And she said, read the introduction. I mean, this is a whole sort of lyric love poem story thing, but in the introduction, he talks about the banks of the Cape Fear River. The Cape Fear River runs by Fayetteville, North Carolina. Some random person in Iowa is unlikely to write lyrically of the Cape Fear River, this was my guy. And he did get there. And he's calling himself an MD. The same year that the census says he's a plasterer. And I can only see that as aspirational. Or maybe he was also in a, thanks to the fact that in an Iowa census in 1856, he was in a rooming house with a doctor. And maybe he was learning from the doctor. And as I say, it was aspirational, but there wasn't any place for him to go to medical school at that point. Um, and the themes you find in his life 
is the lack of a place, a place to be educated, a place to work freely, a place where they could not be captured as free blacks were captured, say, in 12 years a slave and sold down in Mississippi. Um, he found a lot of prejudice against free blacks in Ohio and Iowa, as well as North Carolina. Um, he joined the Colored Anti-Slavery Society in Cleveland in 1857, became friends with John Langston, who was the first colored man, just using their language, admitted to the bar in the state. And after the Dred Scott decision that said African Americans can never be citizens of the United States, even if their great grandfathers fought in the Revolutionary War as free men, they can never have the rights of citizens. Um, and Dr. Harris was involved in John Brown's raid. He wasn't with them and helped raise money for them. And that, of course, ended in disaster. He said, there's no place for a free black man in America. I'm going to Haiti and see if I can find a way to build a local colony down there. So he did, and he wrote letters home that became another book um, about the prospects for American blacks to go to the one country in the world where black slaves had thrown off the yoke of white masters and created their own republic. Now he was a little starry-eyed about Haiti. Haiti had dictators and cruel governments and all this sort of thing, but at least that's what he was looking for. You can see the hope. He's trying to find a place. This is uh, 1861, I believe, 1860. He comes home sometime in 1861, comes back to New York. Certainly by 1863, he was back in the United States, studying medicine in Cleveland with a local doc. He took classes at Case Western Medical School. He got an MD degree from Keokuk, Iowa, which I don't know much about. He may not have even been to Keokuk, but this may have been something he purchased. One of the doctors in the exhibit downstairs I just saw also got his degree from Keokuk, so I need to find out more about that. He became a contract surgeon in the U.S. Army. So how did this happen? I mean, think of the transitions in this guy's life. Let me show you a few other documents about him, and then we'll go back to what had happened in the United States by 1863. A few things. This is just something so I've been searching for this guy, and I find his papers in the National Archives, and this was part of his exam to become a surgeon in the Army, and I opened this document maybe for the first time since it had been tied up in 1865 to read autobiography. And that was just, you have moments in your life. Your child is born, you get married, maybe not in that order, but, uh, and you find this document. I am an American by birth, etc. It didn't tell me many things I wanted to know, but it was exciting. He is, his first sentence is, I am an American. Dred Scott be damned, I'm an American. Okay? He's a citizen. This is a hospital where he works in Portsmouth, Virginia. It was a hotel, it became a hotel again. This is obviously a more modern photo with it. Um, car in the front of it. This is a medical report of his handwriting about who's in his hospital. And some response to how the Virginians, the white Virginians, responded to this amazing thing a black doctor practicing medicine in Virginia. This is from a black religious journal. Now I like reading it. The union hating, rebel loving, good men provoking, and gallows deserving Portsmouthians, so white people in Portsmouth, Virginia, were terribly startled. And with eyes extended, mouth open, hair on end, and hands in pockets, they could be seen in groups talking very low. A union man approached one of the groups and inquired what was the matter. Why, says one of the FFDs, first families of Virginia, there's a Negro doctor in Portsmouth in the capacity of a U.S. surgeon. It was too much. A Negro MD upon the sacred soil? They could not stand it. Some of them tried to die. Others went in search of the last ditch. 
While Surgeon Harris, with an ability that is second to no surgeon in his department, was rendering invaluable service to the sick and wounded soldiers, there was a sort of standard thing among the rebels that they will die in the last ditch. So how did this amazing thing happen? Well, first of all, there was a little war on, Fort Sumter and all that. And Lincoln gets pushed over the next three years from hoping to find a way to peaceably interact with the South to facing the fact that the slaves are going to be free. He didn't want to do that. That wasn't his initial plan, but it, it gets there. And the first slaves to push this idea, the first event that pushes this idea, were refugee slaves. Um, that forced the discussion of emancipation. So the Union troops get control of the distal part of the Virginia Peninsula, the James River Peninsula at Fort Monroe, and slaves are pouring into the Union lines. They want to work, they want to do whatever they can. can. They're escaped slaves. They certainly don't want to go to their masters. Their masters come to the Union Army and say, the Fugitive Slave Act is still in effect. You've got my slaves given back. And uh, Benjamin Butler didn't like this idea. And he came up with this idea of the contraband theory. Now, if the Indian Army captures your horse while you're in fighting, then that horse is contraband because you could use that horse to buy your field and help your army. So, Butler says these men are contraband of war, just like horses, just like cows, just like wagons. It's not a very complimentary statement, but he is saying he's giving them a different category, and that category under the rules of war is a legal thing. Butler has just freed the first slaves of the Civil War in that sense, and it becomes the basis of black freedom near the Union lines. Now, there are a few things happened in 1863, just a few. The Emancipation Proclamation, moving from um, what Butler did to, by January 1st, 1863, Lincoln freed all the slaves in the states in rebellion. It's interesting to know he did not free the slaves in Kentucky or Missouri or Maryland, which were not entirely in rebellion. Um, but he also began large-scale enlistment of black troops. By the end of the war, 10% of the Union Army were black. It's an amazing population advantage. And the, in that year, people said, oh, they won't fight, they'll be cowards. Well, they fought um, at various battles that were heavily reported on. So, not only was the abolition of slavery now in view, black men were active participants in winning the war that would make that happen. So, I'm going to talk here. You've noticed the typeface change and the slides from a different talk. But it's from my research on the health of the black troops and what happened when white northern doctors first saw. Uh, black men in large numbers for the first time. Um, they have been told by all sorts of southern doctors that, they, that the diseases of these people were different, that all sorts of things about them were different. And they had lots of questions about that. They explored them, they wrote about them. Um, they found that black soldiers had alarming rates of morbidity, that's getting diseases and mortality, that's dying of them. Um, and then these contraband camps, these refugee camps around military bases, the, more, the yearly mortality was very high, on the order of 25%. So if there is something to this population is in the same way. Um, probably the worst regiment was the 65th U.S. Colored Infantry, and that was their official name, U.S. Colored Church, U.S. Colored Infantry. Um, lost 772 out of 1,700 men, and they saw no comeback. This was all death from disease. So what does this mean? Are black men really physically weaker? They need to be taken care of by whites. Um, they couldn't be free. All these questions are explored in great detail in my book, Intense and Human. 
um, and a little bit in this talk. So here's just some stats. Um, U.S. colored troops died from disease at um, more than twice the rate of whites. They didn't die in battle so much because they weren't put in battle. They'd rather put the black troops guarding the forts, say, on the rivers or behind the lines as the armies moved forward, so-called garrison situation. Um, but still, the mortality was higher for blacks and whites. One thing to realize is about 75% of those black troops were former slaves. Yes, they were free blacks in the north, um, but those former slaves had grown up malnourished, um, often suffered extensively before they got into the country, into the Union lines. And so one of the reasons when they became soldiers that they did so well is because they started out with their um, Many were illiterate and couldn't advocate for themselves very well. Um, they arrived malnourished, as I said. Um, some who should have been exempted would have been exempted if they were white. It was like, well, it doesn't matter, they're just the black group that can come on in. Um, and there was no external advocacy group. I could talk about that as you can see. Um, they were treated as second class soldiers. They weren't paid the same. Because of that, they couldn't buy food from the kind of vendors that would flock around the military camps. They got poor quality rations. They were issued tents and clothing that had been turned in by white regiments as, you know, so ratty and full of holes it was no longer useful. Um, and the officers were largely white and there for promotion and pay, not for some glory like Robert Wood Shaw and Louis Moore. Um, their medical care was not very good. They never had enough doctors. They didn't have enough medicines. Their hospitals were much more poorly managed than white troops. And they didn't, they weren't believed when they said, I'm exhausted, I have a fever, I need to take some time off. They were just told, oh, you are faking it. Just like when you're told slaves malinger, you're malingering. Um, so one question is, how are we going to solve the problem of not enough doctors? And one answer was put forward is we ought to turn hospital stewards into doctors. Now, to know what that means, it helps to know what a hospital steward is. In some ways, the steward was a pharmacist. Often he might be trained on the spot by the doctor if, if he showed skill um, at remembering things, at being able to measure things, this sort of thing. Or he had worked in a pharmacy back home. There were no pharmacies at this time. It helped if he understood Latin because doctors like did it now like to write prescriptions in Latin to show how cool they are. Um, so, but they hadn't had medical training. Um, and, but people said, well, they're good enough for the black troops. But General Lorenzo Thomas who did a lot of the recruiting in um, the Midwest and the Upper South that's below the Midwest, Tennessee. Kentucky and so forth, uh, was a staunch abolitionist and supporter of these troops and said they're not good enough for that. Now, Nathaniel Banks had another argument that black troops could go to war right beside white troops. You know, and here's the black regiment, run, 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 bang, 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 and here's the white regiment, you know, run, 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 bang, 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 and they get all intermixed. Um, here's a first aid tent that may be manned by the black troops officer, but the or black troops so, uh, doctor, but the white guy has curled over to it, so that incompetent black troop doctor may end up treating white troops, and he can't do that. So uh, any officer might be subjected to the necessity of surgical treatment by this class of officers. So we can't do that. We've got to have these people. One thing Banks did was to send, he was general of the armies from the lower Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana. He sent scouts out to medical schools. Let's round up some recent medical students. And he hired some of these people. But uh, in one of the few letters we have from a black patient, 
The doctors visit them about three times a week and they do more harm than good. They poison the soldiers. They are called doctors, but they are not. They're only students who knows nothing about issuing medicines. This book was a little bigger with an audience of medical students, but anyway. Um, <laughs> the, well, if we're not going to do any of those things, why don't we get some black doctors? Hey, what a concept. So A.T. Augusta was a well-trained surgeon. He had gone to the University of Toronto Medical School, but he couldn't get to medical school in the United States. And he said, I beg leave to apply to you for an appointment as surgeon to some of the colored regiments want to be used to my race. Augusta would go on to be one of the founding doctors at Howard Medical School and to be a leader of the black medical profession after the war. So that sounded good. He gets appointed major and surgeon of the 7th U.S. Colored Infantry. Now, major was the insurgent with the highest ranks in the regimental level for doctors. There was um, assistant surgeons and so forth down the ranks, but they're putting him in charge of the doctors in a given regiment. This was a problem. Have any of you been in the military? Someone's above you in rank, and you're in the military. What do you have to do when you meet that person? The person who you have to salute and acknowledge the right. The person who you have to salute and acknowledge the right. I acknowledge the right. You have to acknowledge that they're above you, right? In power and knowledge and work. That is now a major. In the volunteer army, they still in it. There were a whole lot of white assistant surgeons that he suddenly outranked. And one of them wrote to John Sherman of Ohio, brother of that other Sherman, of which we dislike speaking in the South, and said, John Sherman was a senator, this wrong is grave, unjust, and humiliating. This thing of amalgamation or miscegenation in the appointment of officers, I do not believe in. You cannot make a white man sold the black man. There's a problem. Um, and other people, this is just one of the nastiest quotes, but other people responded that way too. Um, and the army realized this. They were, they were going too fast. So they did a couple of things. One, they sent Augusta off to Baltimore to be the surgeon in the place where they were taking in troops. So there weren't any other assistant surgeons with him there, and he was working only with the black troops. Um, then there were only two others who got regular commissions in the war, um, and I think they were done as assistants, and the rest were hired as contract surgeons, which means they'd be hired for a month. They do not have a rank, and therefore you get out of this um, problem of rank issues. So you'll see downstairs many more of these black surgeons uh, that Jill found. It's very impressive. Um, but just to get a sense of how bad the surgeons were in this regiment where so many people died, surgeon, you're supposed to have three surgeons. Surgeon one was a year out of medical school. He gets appointed as head surgeon, developed a hernia, and he's gone. Very quickly, surgeon two joined was dead one month later of diarrhea. Surgeon three joined, got sick, left in November, and surgeon four joined and lasted for a year. So there were times they had no surgeons at all, or just at best one. Um, so what? Given mid 19th century medicine, weren't they better off without doctors? Um, and certainly you could make that argument. Lots of one of the principal tools of 19th century doctors was bloodletting, got little Lovely thing here is a spring looking razor blade basically to cut the vein. Uh, they gave very harsh medicines, um, such as mercury compounds and other harsh electives. And so you might say it'd be better to get by without doctors. But doctors could hand out some important things in the Civil War. They had quinine, which, yes, has side effects, but there was a lot of malaria in the war, so this was helpful. 
if you were going to have your leg cut off, you would be happy to know that they had chloroform in the field and ether if you're back at a big hospital base. They had opium, which both, or opium compounds, morphine, which both treated pain and slowed down diarrhea. So they did have some effective drugs. They also um, could put you in the hospital where you could get regular food, warmth, rest, hydration, things that you might not be getting in the field. And they also controlled, well, no, I'm going to say this first. Surgery could save lives, and I could talk some about. Um, amputations and sort of iconic uh, surgery in Civil War. And they also controlled resting furloughs, furloughs being time home. You get to go home for a month or go home for six weeks. And the white doctors had little sympathy for the black troops, were very prone to not believe them. It was also harder to send them home because they didn't have a home. Um, and they worked the black troops more as kind of manual laborers than his soldiers. Um, and they were less likely to call in, for example, there's an agency called the United States Sanitary Commission which could bring in extra food, blankets, pajamas, various things, sort of like the Red Cross. But the white doctors were the ones that had called them and they might not think that was important for them to do. So, one experiment I really like uh, was done by Ira Russell. I have uh, um, somebody I've been fair to work on, so much so that my husband said, are you having an affair? Because I have a Russell guy, you talk about him all the time. I said he died in 1877. Well, all right then, okay. Um, Russell was a surgeon in the woods for many of Massachusetts. Uh, and he ended up in charge of a big hospital in St. Louis at the fairgrounds in St. Louis. And they had one, they had several wards of black troops there. Um, and one was doing well and the others weren't. And the doctors are the ones that weren't doing well said, well, you just can't treat a Negro. Uh, they don't respond well to medicines, blah, blah, blah. And Russell said, well, how come this ward's doing okay? Well, they must have been better treated. So Russell said, okay, we're going to shuffle the wards. So they put the doctor to the good ward onto another one of the bad wards and put a bad doctor on to the good and the whole situation reversed. And he taught them that, you know, the value of kindness, care, paying attention, taking them seriously and human beings was very important. He also created nurse training programs, including for black nurses in St. Louis. He was a genuinely good guy. Nursing care was important in the war and inadequate. Susie Taylor is pictured here. She's pictured on the poster. Um, she's pictured just about everywhere because she is one of the only black nurses from the war that we have a picture of. She was also 14 when she served as a Civil War nurse, um, I think, in the Sea Islands of South Carolina. But she wrote a book about it when she was an adult, and that's why we know something about it. Um, but at least she could advocate for the men that can help argue that they needed help, as many of the white nurses do. Um, I don't know how many of you know Jane Schultz's book, Women at the Front, or other books mainly about the white nurses in the world. Some of those white nurses were really up in ditches. They were middle or upper class, they were new senators, they were from good families, and if there was a doctor on a ward, in Philadelphia or in Annapolis or in DC, who was a drug who was mistreating his patient, well, they could go call on Uncle Henry, who was, you know, Speaker of the House, and say, I just made that up. But, you know, they had connections to say, get this guy fired. So the black patients didn't have that sort of intersection, but at least they had. Some women who were of their own race and other women who cared about them, even if they were white. Um, now, you can also want to say, were there black nurses in the war? Three quarters of the care in southern hospitals was provided by black people, enslaved black people. And I've often wondered what that dynamic was like, because 
Then you have rebel troops who are helpless in some way or the other. They're there because they got their leg cut off. They're there because they got diarrhea and they're messing their bed every three or four hours. They've got a high fever. Somebody needs to give them water. And the people taking care of them know that this man in this bed is fighting to keep them in sight. And yes, they were supervised, but it's hard to supervise people in all the little ways, the paying attention, the caring, and the mortality rate in Southern Hospital is much higher than in Northern Hospital. And I can't but think that was one of the reasons. Um, that it's just, it was a thousand little things by people who didn't think they liked the patients they were taking care of. But I have no proof of that, that's just my message. Okay. Um, so I said that, um, back to my Dr. Harris, that by 1864 he was a doctor in Portsmouth. By 1865 he was practicing in Howard's Grove Hospital in Richmond. Howard's Grove had been the smallpox hospital for the Confederacy. The Confederacy was in the and you know, the black troops and the treatment always got the last uh, choice, and so they put the in the hospital that had been the union, had been the Confederate Smallpox Hospital. And Harris was there when my buddy Iron Russell walked through surveying the health of the treatment uh, in Richmond, Virginia. So Russell was in St. Louis. Now he's been asked by the Senator Commission just go see what's happening with the freedmen and the colored troops who were still in the hospital. So, you know, the story comes together. Russell, that's where I first met Dr. Harris. Russell tells us about this remarkable black doctor who was um, practicing in Virginia. So in summary, the war created opportunities for black professionals, including doctors and nurses. Post-war, the founding of Howard and other colleges, including the idea of medical training. Who says those things? Thank you. I'm not sure. I think I lost the word there or something. But Howard and my area in Nashville and other schools, they didn't all survive. But that part of the philanthropic reaction to um, the need of the freedmen and the black people for their own doctor. Black nurses would be trained in their own medical schools, but it would be a couple of decades yet. Um, but the first professional women's nursing school appeared in the 1870s, the first one in Columbia. So that process is encouraged by the war. So I will stop there. Um, if the panel for someone says something else. The rapidity of the change in the American Civil War still bothers the mind. I mean, you go from 4,000 people in slavery in 1860 to nominally free in 1865. And of course, it's probably evident that it did happen too fast. And uh, in some alternative universe where it might have happened slower and people could have adjusted to it in some way, I don't know. I'm not saying it should have been, but. Um, it was horrendously fast, and that set up many of the reactions after the war and the totally destroyed the Southern agricultural market. Um, but it's the beginning of the black middle class in the North, includes at slaves and the free blacks who see themselves as leading their people on. Um, Harris's brothers were in Virginia after the war, teaching the freedmen to read and write and preaching the gospel and doing all this sort of thing as part of this change of empowerment for these people. So I'll stop and I'm glad to take questions or we can go with cookies. Yes, sir. The Sanitary Commission was frequently involved with medical care, particularly in the northeastern states of the war. Uh, were they involved at all with uh, colored infantry? Regiment care, or were they restricted against from helping them? The Sanitary Commission was pretty loosely affiliated with the Union government, um, but founded by 
women in New York um, in the spring of 1861, and then headed by men. Um, it gathered money, it gathered supplies, it organized women to sew things like sheets and pajamas and all this sort of thing. They did respond to um, calls for to help the colored troops. They, they were not at all restricted. One of the problems is somebody had to tell them so that the need was there. And here's an example of it. In the spring of 1865, the Union, you might think it was all over, but there was fear that the emperor in Mexico, his name was Max Lillian, he was a French puppet, was going to invade Texas. And that the Southerners, like Jeff Davis was trying to get to Texas, that there were Southern leaders and, and other people who were trying to escape to Texas and maybe line up with the French and start some new thing. So the Union wanted to send troops to the Texas border, to Brownsville and Galveston and that area. But everybody was sick of war, and the troops that had been enrolled most recently in 1863 were the black troops. So many of the troops that got sent to Texas when everybody else was done um, were the black troops. They got very bad medical care. They were so isolated, they got a lot of scurvy because their white officers took the money they were supposed to spend on food and, and uh, bought liquor from Mexico and sold that liquor to, you know, they had this whole thing going. Um, and the hospitals were overwhelmed and they started sending the sick black men to New Orleans because they were out of hospital beds in Texas. And that's the only way the Sanitary Commission found out that there was this huge epidemic of scurvy because the officers didn't call them, but there were sanitary commission people in New Orleans who said, we've got 100 black troops with scurvy to come out of Texas, something's going on. So it sort of gives you a sense. They had to be asked for help. Um, and they may not have been as in the cycle of aid and assistance and for white troops in the hospital. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Virginia and paid by the Freedmen's Bureau after he stopped being a doctor to the Army. And the Freedmen's Bureau said they would take care of the free slaves' medical needs, and they did for a few years and then they dropped it. In 1868 or 69, the Republican, the, the Confederate whites couldn't vote yet in Virginia. And the Republican Party of Virginia put Harris up as its candidate for lieutenant governor um, with a Republican for governor. But there was another group of Republicans that didn't like that. They put their own candidate. Harris ended up losing, but only by 10 or 20,000 votes. I mean, it was very close. Um, he went from there, he got an appointment at an insane asylum in South Carolina. This is a political appointment in Columbia, South Carolina. He was there for a while, but then, as the Redeemer governments, if you know what that means, the, the old Confederate-style leadership starts to ooze back into power, particularly in South Carolina. They threw him out. They really didn't like him because he had a white wife. I looked that out. Anyway. Um, so they went back to Virginia. Harris was at Howard Medical School for a while. Um, and then he got sick. He had um, epilepsy, and with the epilepsy came what they called mania insanity. He got admitted to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., and he lived there for the next 10 years, and he died there. It's not a It's incredible life. Um, and tragic end. And one of his sons wrote a song that Elvis recorded. <laughs> 
Thank you for coming. Let's come down for cookies and uh, the whatever else is going on.